Hello my golden boys and girls, and we're starting Unit 2, Human Resource Management. The main point of this class is to 1. See what HR means, 2. Understand what impacts HR planning, and 3. Understand why change is so important and difficult for employees and managers. There are four assessment objectives, please take a moment to pause the video and have a look at them. Part 1 of this class is the role of HR management. First of all, HR or human resources can refer to several things. Mainly, it refers to people that constitute the workforce of an organization. Organization in this case does not necessarily have to be a company. It can be a company or partnership or a non-profit organization or a country or a region. That's what HR can refer to. Also, it can refer to human resources department within an organization that is in charge of human resources. Human resource management or HRM is a business function that corresponds to the process of organizing people and maximizing their efficiency. It is believed that human resources is the most important business function because no business can work without people and people are the most valuable resource, but you can argue with that. This business function is particularly important to service industries from tertiary and quaternary sector. If you forgot what sectors of industry are, then please review unit one of the business management course. Here is a little reminder for you guys about the input-output model from Unit 1. So there are four kinds of business inputs or factors of production and it is believed that labor or human resources is the most important one. You can agree with that or you can disagree with that. What's important is that you can justify your opinion. So this part of class is called the role of HR management and in order to elaborate on what the role of HR management is, we need to answer the question why HRM is important. I'm going to give you nine reasons why I personally think HRM is important. Keep in mind that these nine reasons are not the only reasons, they don't apply equally to all organizations and there may be way more reasons for that. Actually, everything we learn in Unit 2 explains why HR management is important. So the first one is efficiency. People who work in HR make sure employees are as productive as possible and the workplace allows them to be as productive as possible. The second one is minimizing risk. HR planning, similar to any other kind of planning, is a thing that you do in order to predict the future in a way. This way, if you are prepared to some future events, you minimize the risk. You are more prepared to anything that can happen. The third one is staff retention. Staff retention is how many employees stay in the workplace in a given time. The opposite of staff retention is staff turnover. So one of the roles of HR management and people in HR department is to make sure there are appropriate levels of staff retention and staff turnover. Developing organization structure. HR department is in charge of creating organization charts that help employees understand where they belong in the company, who their line manager is, who they are responsible for, and etc. It creates a sense of belonging for people at work. PD and training. PD means professional development. So one of the roles of HRM is to make sure that all people are adequately trained and know how to do their work. Motivation. One of the things that HRM is in charge of is making sure there are appropriate financial and non-financial rewards for all employees that we'll talk about later in unit two, of course. Change management is something that we'll talk about in the last part of this class, but for now, Change is something that's really difficult for people because humans naturally resist change. So making sure that change goes smoothly is also one thing that HR deals with. Recruitment and selection. This is something self-explanatory. You need to select the best people and hire them. And in addition to that, HR management is important because it's in charge of redundancies and dismissals. Human resources do not always expand in size. Sometimes you need to let people go. If you let people go because they don't do their job well, if you fire them, this is called dismissal. If you let people go because they are excellent workers but their service is just no longer required, this is called a redundancy. Again, surprise, surprise, we'll talk about that more later in Unit 2. So, once again, basically everything we learn in Unit 2 explains why human resource management is important.
Part 2 is factors that influence HR planning and our objective here is to analyze internal and external factors that influence HR planning. <laughs> HR planning or HRP is a systematic process of anticipating the staffing needs of a company. It can go either way. It can imply expansion or downsizing of the workforce. Downsizing can be achieved through redundancies or dismissals. Dismissals, as I mentioned in the previous part of class, means you fire people for not doing their job well. Redundancies means you lay people off, you let them go because their service is no longer required, even though they do their job really well. We'll talk more about that later in Unit 2. What's important here is that all organizations, regardless of their size, from really small sole traders to huge multinational corporations and public limited companies, all of them do HR planning. Some of them keep HRP in their mind, but some of them have a really detailed and serious document. Regardless of that, HRP is something that is inevitable, something that always takes place. Also, human resource planning takes place on different levels of management in an organization. Remember, this is something that we learned in Unit 1. There is strategic level, tactical level, and operational level, and HRP can take place on all of these levels. Human resource planning is something like a link between human resource management that we talked about in the first part of this class and strategic goal of an organization. So basically, it means that if a company wants to achieve something, it needs to manage it, its workforce. But how to manage workforce in such a way so that we can achieve that goal? We need human resource planning to make sure the goal is achieved with the help of HR. So HRP acts as a link between human resource management and strategic goals of organization. Now, once we know what human resource planning is, we are ready to talk about factors that impact HRP. These factors can be divided in two parts. Some of them are internal, which means that this is something from within an organization, and some of them are external, which means that this is something from the external environment. Speaking of internal factors, I'm going to give you three examples that I find the most relevant. First of all, it's leadership styles. I think it's not a secret that the personality of a leader impacts the entire organization. There are different leadership styles that different leaders might have, for example, laissez-faire, democratic, autocratic, situational or paternalistic, and one is not better than the other, they are just different. What matters is that this leadership style affects organization in different ways. More about leadership styles in Unit 2. All you need to know now is that leadership styles is one of the internal factors that impact human resource planning. The second internal factor that might impact HRP is strategies and objectives. This is something that we learned in Unit 1, in 1.3 to be more specific, and objectives and strategies is what company tries to achieve and how it achieves that. Different objectives and different strategies might mean that you need to plan differently in order to achieve these objectives. For example, some strategies might imply increasing the workforce, whereas other strategies might result in the opposite thing, in downsizing. Whatever strategy or objective is, it is an internal factor that impacts HRP. And lastly, finance is another internal factor that impacts human resource planning. Resources are limited and company has a budget. Company operations are limited by the budget constraints. You cannot afford whatever you want. So whatever you plan has to be in line with the budget. More about finance in Unit 3. Stay tuned. So changing any of these, changing leadership styles, changing strategies and objectives, and changing financial situation might impact human resource planning. Speaking of external factors, there are plenty external factors. Anything in external environment can impact human resource planning. However, what I'm going to share with you now is only five factors that I be included in business management subject guide. It doesn't mean that these are the most important factors. It doesn't mean that they apply equally to all organizations. It just means that this is something that IB wants you to know and I'm going to tell you about it. So, first of all, demographic change. Demographics is studies of the population. For example, birth rates, mortality rates, life expectancy, and etc. Anything that relates to population is demographic change. 
This is something in an external environment, but it impacts all organizations. Check out the latest demographic changes in your country by following the link below and think how it affects your favorite company. The second factor that might impact human resource planning is labor mobility. Labor mobility means flexibility of labor in terms of certain aspects. Geographic labor mobility means that people can easily relocate from point one to point B in a country. They can change their location easily. For example, the USA and China have relatively high geographic labor mobility. People are born in one place, then they go to college to the second place, then they work in the third place, and then they are relocated for professional reasons to the fourth place. They can move easily. Another kind of labor mobility is occupational labor mobility. It means that people can easily change their jobs, change the nature of their jobs. For example, you were a teacher for 10 years and then you decided to be an actor. And if this career shift is really common in an economy, then it means that this is an indicator of high occupational mobility in this economy. The third reason is immigration. Uh, we are now not talking about immigration for political reasons, we are talking about professional immigration that does not even have to result in getting a new passport. For example, I am an immigrant, I work in China, same as all the foreign teachers in my school, we all moved to China for professional reasons. The ability to hire people from anywhere in the world increases the pool of the applicants and can result in different ideas and cultural exchange. However, it also comes with certain drawbacks. For example, cultural clash. The fourth factor is flexi time. Flexi time or flexible time is a trend in the working practices when employees do not have to be in the office to clock in and clock out, come at nine and leave at five or something like that. People can create their own schedule that is based on their own needs. What matters is that they have to complete their tasks before the deadline what their working hours are doesn't really matter. Flexi time allows people to combine their personal needs with professional tasks. Of course, it will not work well for some professions. However, in general, for creative industries, it works really well. The fifth factor is called gig economy. This is a type of economy where short-term commitments, part-time, temporary contracts are really common, when commitment is not that serious. It doesn't mean that this is a bad economy. It just means it largely relies on freelance, on getting work done, where it doesn't really matter that you go to the office or not go to the office, where you sign a permanent contract. All of these don't matter in gig economy. So these were the internal factors that impact human resource planning and external factors that impact human resource planning. Please keep in mind that they do not apply equally to all the organizations and these are not the only factors that might impact that. Besides, keep in mind that all these factors can be an opportunity and a threat at the same time. It's not just good or just bad, it can be both at the same time. If you were in my class right now, I would ask you to extend the list of internal and external factors and also think how each of the factors presents an opportunity and or a threat to the company of your choice. The third part of this class is change. We have two assessment objectives here, suggesting the reasons to change and discussing nature strategies for reducing the change. I'm going to use one theory to explain both, to kill two birds with one stone. But first of all, let's figure out what change is. So now we're not talking about change in general, we're talking about change at workplace. Basically change at workplace means having to do things differently, the change of current working practices and patterns. Human beings do not naturally like change because it's scary, because you have to do things differently, because you don't know that if you do things differently, you will still be successful or not. This is a bit scary. However, not to change means not to develop. Change is inevitable. This is something that has to happen. Probably in some of your favorite movies or TV shows, you heard about the five stages of grief. In academic circles, they are called Kubler-Ross change curve. Or maybe I should say Kubler-Ross, because there's you with an ulna out there. 
Anyways, there are five stages of grief in this change curve. The first one is denial, when you do not accept that you have to change. Then it's anger, because you have to do things differently. Then it's depression, when you feel really sad. Then it's bargaining, when you try to negotiate the benefits of change with yourself. And then finally, it's acceptance and integration of change. If you also take IBDP psychology course, I'm quite sure you will study these five stages of grief. If not, just look it up online to know more. My point here is that change is difficult, right? Also, Kubler-Ross model applies to, to some negative personal change, for example, the loss of the loved ones. But in business management, change does not usually imply the loss of the loved ones. However, the stages are pretty much the same. It's denial, anger, depression, bargaining and acceptance. So now you know what change is, I also suggest you watch one video that looks a little bit weird and cute at the same time and, it's, and it explains what change is and how to deal with change brilliantly. It's just less than 5 minutes long. Please have a look at this video, it's really good and you will have a really brief overview of what change is and how to deal with it. If you have already watched the video, then now you are ready to finally talk about the reasons why people resist change and some strategies or approaches how to deal with change. I'm going to use Cotter and Schlesinger's change theory. I'm saying change theory in quotation marks because it's not actually a change theory. Actually, it's called Cotter and Schlesinger for reasons to, for resistance to change and Cotter and Schlesinger for approaches to change. This sounds really long, so I hope that Cotter and Schlesinger will forgive me if I just call it change theory for simplicity. So basically, there are four reasons why people resist change and four strategies how to deal with change, how to drive change. All of these apply to businesses and to change at workplace. Let's see the reasons in more detail. First, self-interest. Employees do not understand how change benefits them personally and do not really care about distant and intangible benefits for the organization. Thus, they are reluctant to drive change, not knowing how it benefits them personally. It is quite cynical, but yet it's true. Second is misunderstanding. Sometimes there are actually benefits to employees, but they are not explained correctly or misunderstood by them. The third one is low tolerance. Having to change means stop doing things that are secure and safe. Some employees might not be able to bear with it well. Fourth reason is different assessments of the situation. Different people see the same thing from different perspectives. Very often, what the boss sees as an opportunity is perceived as a threat by employees. So these are the four reasons. They summarize really well, in my opinion, things that might happen at a workplace that might cause resistance to change. Now we're ready to talk about strategies, approaches, things we can do in order to drive change smoothly. The first one is education and communication. This is the most smooth and nice way to deal with change. You prepare employees to it, you train them, and you let them to be the drivers of change. Unfortunately, there is not always enough time for that. The second one is participation and involvement. If employees are empowered, and they are part of decision-making process in an organization, they demonstrate more loyalty and flexibility towards change because they feel that they are part of it. Thus, making employees involved and engaged reduces resistance to change. The third strategy is facilitation and support. This simply means being supportive and caring to employees because they might be afraid to change their working routines. Facilitation and support never hurts. The fourth strategy is negotiation. This implies reconsideration of the current incentives of financial and non-financial rewards and trying to make mutual concessions for the benefits of implementing change. Usually it works well for highly skilled and experienced employees who cannot stand being patronized. The fifth strategy is co-optation and manipulation. If the four methods above do not work, then managers might find employees who have influence over others and try to appoint them a certain role that helps to promote and implement the desired change. So the way it works is basically you find employees who have a certain influence on other employees and you tell them now you are going to drive this change. If you do it, then this is what happens. If you don't do it, then that is what happens. Where that is usually something unpleasant. 
The sixth strategy is coercion. This is the least nice strategy to overcome resistance to change. It is the ultimate form of the previous strategy, co-optation and manipulation. But it implies more dramatic effects such as dismissals and loss of certain benefits. This strategy does not really overcome the resistance, it mainly pushes change through. And in the long term, if change was not really necessary, then this strategy does not really make sense. It only works well if you are sure that this change needs to be implemented and if there is great resistance to this change. And now, the most important part, after we figured out what the four reasons to change and the six strategies to overcome and resistance to change are, is to understand that they are not universal, they do not apply to all organizations equally, and they are not the only reasons and strategies that can be used in the workplace. There are many other change models and theories. I have just talked about the one that personally I find the most appropriate and the most concise and the most on point. Thank you, Kotter and Schlesinger. I hope I pronounced their names right. Bye-bye.